Hey guys, so not much has happened with my gas chromatograph for the past year or so, or half a year at least. Um, I've been preoccupied with other projects. Recently a few people has asked about details of how I built the thermal conductivity detector and uh, I realized that I didn't really spend much time on that at all in the previous video, so I thought it might be worth a little follow-up video. The theory of this thing is, is pretty simple actually. For any resistive element, when a current is passed through it, it'll heat up until it reaches some kind of equilibrium, with the heat being wicked off of it. And in a steady flow of gas, the amount of heat being wicked off of it is proportional to the heat capacity of the gas, thermal conductivity. So that means, and this is an intri intrinsic probability for each gas, so it'll differ between different gases. That's what you exploit in this kind of detector. So basically, you'll have some kind of heated filament and you'll have your carrier gas passed over it and it'll reach some kind of current. Then when some sample flows over it, the, the thermal conductivity of the gas will change, the amount of heat being wicked off of these elements will change, they'll increase or decrease in temperature, and the resistance of the filament will change, and thus the current through them will change. And you can detect this as a voltage drop. This is the basic thermal conductivity detector, and it's literally just four filaments, little thin wire filaments in a wing bridge configuration here, um, with a, some additional circuitry I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and you have two of them in your reference flow, and you have two of them in your sample flow. What will happen is that there will never be a change in the reference flow. It'll have the same thermal conductivity and wick the same amount of heat off of the filaments at all times, but once an analyte passes over the other two filaments, the amount of heat wicked off with either, will either increase or decrease. They will, it'll usually decrease since helium is the gas with one of the highest thermal conductivities out there. So it'll usually decrease. You can make these bridges with both two and four elements. The, I opted for four elements since if you have two elements, you'll replace two of these, one in each direction with resistors and you'll have to match these resistors and of course any increase or decrease in temperature of these resistors will give a false signal of some sort, so that's unfavorable. Let me show you how I actually built this, because it's actually fairly lucky. So this is what I was talking about, you've seen this before, it's disassembled because I was bringing it to a job interview. Um, this is the reference side, comes in here, this is the injection port, column and output side of the detector. And you see I'm using these little T fittings here. Let me go ahead and take, this is just an aluminum block I've mounted them to, to in order to try and equalize the temperature of them. I had them heated at some point as well. But this is just a T fitting, standard swage lock. Okay, this isn't swage lock, but knockoff swage lock fitting. And in the third, the side port here, under these nuts, you will see this is the thermal conductivity element. If we can focus on that, that would be nice. Yeah. What it is, is literally just a tiny light bulb. I was able to source some uh, 1 8 inch light bulbs, which fits these fittings exactly. This is a Teflon ferrule. It's crimped around the bulb, so I don't want to remove it, but this is just a light bulb cut open. Uh, very, very carefully with some fine um, silicon carbide emery cloth. That's the little filament, little tungsten filament that the gas passes over. And I have four of those on here, which corresponds to the ones you see here. Additional circuitry is a, uh, a constant current source here. This is just an LM317 set up for 150 milliamps. That's about maximum for these bulbs. Then there is a potentiometer here which sets the zero. It's of course important that you can, can null this out so you get a zero difference. What we're really measuring is that you're measuring the difference in voltage between these two points and you get a differential signal out of that. I have an attenuator here. That's not a terribly good idea because it's, once you change that it's going to be difficult to replicate. What I really wanted is a uh, like a fixed attenuator but uh, for the test run, I just used a potentiometer. Let me show you how this circuit actually looks in real life. I have this here, and um, you can see the controls here. 
I have the zero here as a 10 turn pot with a locking vernier scale. I have the attenuator here. I'll be honest, I've never used it. And I have a switch here, which just switches the polarity of the output signal. Remember, what you're really detecting is the difference in the thermal conductivity from helium. So any analyte that wicks heat better than helium will give signal one way, and any analyte that wicks heat more poorly than helium will go the other way. Usually they will all wick heat more poorly, but it's nice to be able to switch polarity. Since I don't have a bipolar power supply for this, and I'm feeding it into a 0 to 5 volt microcontroller ADC. And uh, you can see the switch configuration here. As you'll see here, more circuitry. There's a battery, there's a little chip. And let me show you that. This is an analog device, AD8226. This is called an instrumentation amplifier. This is basically a free op amps in one, and it's, it's a differential amplifier between these two inputs here. It's very closely matched, all the, uh, the resistance networks inside of it, and it's, uh, it's set up with a single resistor for gain. Uh, and you can give it a reference voltage in. I've chosen a reference voltage that isn't zero specifically, so I don't need to have a bipolar supply, simply because it's, it's easier to handle. And uh, my reference voltage is just an AA battery solder directly to it. I opted for this because, simply because it's the simplest solution, and it's a very stable DC source over the 15 minutes to 20 minutes that a run on this thing takes. And then I have a low pass filtering and a SENA diode to protect the input pin of the ADC. It's important to note that once you have a reference voltage that's not zero, when you zero out your bridge, you should not zero it to zero volts, you should zero it to the reference voltage, because that will be the zero for the detector. Um, and aside from that, after this, it just goes to an Arduino with a little data logging program and a, a script that logs that in Excel. That's, uh, that's what you saw last time. Now, there are basically two ways of implementing a thermal conductivity detector. There's the one I've done, where you have a reduction valve, or a pressure regulating valve from the, your tank. And then you have your reference side in series with that. You have your injector, where you inject your sample. You have column, and then you have the detector side on the other side. This is nice, because you know you'll have the same mass flow through both. Um, and uh, And... I found that simpler. Now the other way of doing it, and I've seen this implemented too, is that you can have from your tank pressure, or your reduced tank pressure, your carrier pressure, you can have a split where one side goes to your your inlet and your column, and then the detecting side, and then you have this Y split before here, where the other side goes through some kind of flow restriction uh, and to the reference side. Ideally, this would be an identical column to your column. Um, I've seen this too. I'm not sure what I think is smartest. You could have an inlet on each, and this would be an easy setup if you wanted to have two columns set up. And you could use whatever column, just as long as you didn't use them at the same time. I don't know, I've, I've, I opted for this one, and that's what you have been seeing. All right, I hope you found that interesting. Let me know if you have any questions. The next thing you hear from me will probably be on the topic of either ultra high vacuum systems or cosmic ray spectroscopy. Either way, see you.